Hello, and welcome to another segment of Smoke Signals. I'm your host for today's show, Lieutenant Chris Taylor from the LaGrange Fire Department. We have an awesome show lined up for you. We have special guests that will be here from the Air Evac Life Team and also a guest from the Columbus Regional Hospital. So put down your remote, sit back, and relax because you're about to watch Smoke Signals. Welcome back. Today we have with us two special guests from the Air Evac Life Team. We have uh, Penny Moore and Donald Kofer. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Thank you. It's a pleasure to have you all here today. Uh, I'm quite sure you have some wealth of information to share with our viewer and audience. Um, but before we get into that, um, could you tell us a little bit about yourself and how long you've been with Air Evac? We'll start with you first, Donald. Sure. I'm Donald Kofer. I'm flight paramedic, now the program director at Air Evac 77 here in LaGrange. I've been with Air Evac for about four years now. Started up at Carrollton and then transferred down here to LaGrange. So I've been here in LaGrange probably for about, about three years now. Okay. All right. And Penny? Uh, my name is Penny Moore. Um, I'm a familiar face. I served with LaGrange Police Department for 10 years. Um, served specifically in the DARE program within our school systems here. Um, I have been with Air Evac now for two months as the membership sales manager okay. for this area. Well, it's uh, definitely a pleasure to have you on the show because uh, we've spent uh, quite a few times together on uh, shows in the past when you was a DARE officer with yes. LaGrange Police Department. So um, it's good to see a familiar face. All right, now uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, air evac, you know, and a lot of people probably want to, okay, well, what is air evac? What are y'all talking about? Who is air evac? Well, Donald, if you could, just tell us a little bit about the air evac life team. Air evac life team, are, uh, we're basically the largest independently owned operated air medical service in the country. We have approximately 130 bases in 15 states. And basically what we, we, we do is provide access to definitive care from scenes and hospitals uh, throughout the United States, but particularly here in Georgia and Alabama. Okay. Now, uh, with that, uh, we're talking about uh, an air ambulance, correct? And so, uh, you all deal with patients, um, primarily. Now, as it relates to patients, do you take patients from the hospital to the hospital, or, or what, how does that process work? We, we do both. We, ba we pick up patients from uh, rural hospitals, rural community hospitals that need rapid transport via the helicopter to larger uh, definitive care facilities, whether it be in Atlanta, Macon, Birmingham. Uh, and we also do a lot of emergency scene flights that are directly from the scene where we work with uh, some of the public safety departments here that will request the aircraft at the scene to transport patients to definitive care. Yeah, and, and of course we have a great working relationship with your LaGrange Fire Department because we have uh, quite a few incidents that have occurred over the years since you all have been here and even before uh, you all uh, actually had a, a base here in LaGrange uh, where you all have been very instrumental in helping us out with uh, you know critical patients and having them flown to uh, a definitive care hospital um, because of their injuries. Um, now let's talk about the crew a little bit. Uh, how many people are on the helicopter basically and what and what are their roles? Well, we staff three. We're going to have a pilot. His primary role is just to fly the aircraft. Mm -hmm. uh, that's basically all he does. And then we have a flight nurse uh, that normally has ER experience, critical care experience. And then we have a flight paramedic. Uh, they provide the patient care. They're both going to be in the back. Med crew takes care of the patient. Pilot flies. Mm. Okay. Uh, and we typically have we work similar like fire department and EMS. We do a 24-hour shift, mm -hmm. uh, and then we're off uh, 72 hours. So we're available 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. Okay. Now, now let me ask you this. Uh, uh, what are some things that, that you all typically do? This, just give a typical day. Let's say, for instance, you don't have any calls, which you know, it's probably very rare that you have those. But what are some of the activities that you all engage when you don't have any calls to respond to? We do a lot of training, a lot of maintenance on the aircraft, a lot of work, uh, you know, with, with the equipment, and we also do a lot of community activities. Uh, okay. Now, as far as, and you mentioned co community activities, and we have uh, been on several community activities with you yes. all over the years. 
Uh, kind of tell us a little about some of the uh, community activities that you all participate in. We do a lot of education outreach for public service departments. Uh, we also do, we, we do, we bring the aircraft to, to schools, to daycares, try to get mm -hmm. the kids familiar and, and comfortable around the aircraft in case ever, they ever have to be flown. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we'll do some, some game balls, uh, whether it be a football game, we'll fly in the game, brought the game ball and deliver it at the 50-yard okay. line. That'll be we, neat. We've done it at baseball games. Uh, just anything that we can do to be a part of the community and kind of kind of show that hey we, we, we care and we want to be a part of the community. Okay, and even with that, um, whether it's emergency scenes or or uh, being involved in the community, anytime the helicopter is being used, you know there are some safety factors that have to be uh, taken in consideration. Kind of talk about uh, the safety factors as it relates to you know being around a helicopter. Well. First is the first safety factor for us with our pilots is the weather. We have to make sure we have the, the legal weather minimums to be able to lift and, and fly. That's whether if it's a, a, a scene flight or a hospital transfer or PR. Uh, then once the aircraft lands, we always have somebody there on scene that's kind of what we call LZ command okay. that secures the LZ. If it's during the day, we want at least 65 by 65, clear, free of obstructions. At night, 100 by 100. Uh, and we count on whether it be fire, EMS, or law enforcement. Uh, to, to kind of make sure those scenes are secure. And once the aircraft lands, there's a two minute shutdown period. If we shut down like at a PR, uh, our crew will get out and kind of one person will get through the rear of the aircraft where the tail rotor is mm -hmm. and kind of, kind of like a tail rotor guard and then the other will go off to the nose of the aircraft just to make sure nobody approaches the aircraft during the shutdown. Uh, because if you approach at the wrong time and the, while it's shutting down and the blades are kind of slowing down, the pilot doesn't have control of them. Right. And the blades can come down and be a safety hazard. Okay, and, and, and for our viewing audience, one thing to remember is, you know, when you see an uh, aircraft, you know, head into the area, I know people, it's an excitement, is, you know, because a lot of people are not used to seeing a, a, a helicopter landing and things of that nature, especially uh, in public and private places. True. And, uh, you know, they want to get out and they want to get video, they want to take pictures and all those kind of things, but they, they still got to understand that there are some you know some immediate hazards that are that are in that area and anything can happen and they need to just make sure they stay a safe distance away and listening to uh, public safety officials who are trying to secure the area to make sure that no one gets hurt because you know because you all are there that someone has been injured we need to make sure we get those individuals you know to the hospital as quickly as possible true all right. Now, uh, getting back to uh, community involvement, what are some things, uh, Penny, that you can add to uh, as far as, you know, the involvement of air evac in the community? Well, um, I think that one really important factor about having our crews come out and be part of our community events is that people in our community get the opportunity to talk to our flight crew, mm -hmm. you know, talk to the nurse on board, talk to the paramedic that's on board as well as the pilot, learn more about the aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, and it's just a great interaction for our community to understand what they go through in serving our community in that capacity. I think that's a, a, a great thing because that's one thing that we try to do too. Uh, well, we, we get called to be a part of a lot of community mm -hmm. uh, events and uh, a lot more than people may realize, mm -hmm. but you know, we still have to respond to emergencies. So there are some things that we can't respond to. I mean, we can't participate in, but then there may be some things that we can participate, but only for a short period of time. So, you know, we want people to understand that, uh, you know, community involvement as it relates to public safety, whether it be fire, EMS, police, or, uh, or air ambulance uh, personnel, you know, it's important. And it, like you said, it gives, you know, people opportunity to get close and personal instead of just having to see, you know, the helicopter crew during an emergency situation. You know, it's always good to have that bond and a great working relationship uh, with your public safety yes. in non-emergency situations versus emergency situations. Absolutely. Now, um, Air Evac has a membership program. So let's talk about the membership program and how it works and how the public can get involved. Yes, it's a great way to um, provide protect protection for your family or those that live within your house. Um, Air Evac Life Team is part of Air Med our Air Medicare Network, mm -hmm. which is the largest air medical uh, membership program in the United States. We have more currently more than 2.7 million members in the United wow. States. Yeah, it's large. Awesome. Now, uh, what are the different ways that you can actually go and uh, become a member 
Uh, I'm quite sure there are some people who may not be internet savvy. Now, I'm, I'm sure you have a website where they can go to and a telephone number that they may call if they have questions. Yes, yeah, so our website would be lifeteam.net. Um, they can go online, get that information directly, mm -hmm. um, or they can contact me, Penny Moore, at 256-624-7097. Um, okay. And I'll be glad to answer any questions that they have about membership. Okay, that sounds good. Um, and, and, and I think that's a great program, I mean, because, you know, when you think about it, uh, the health care cost today is, is, is very, very expensive. And, you know, and I don't know how much it costs as far as uh, you all provide a service, but I'm quite sure that membership helps a tremendous amount um, um, for that patient that has to be flown to uh, another hospital. Can you kind of touch on that? Sure, Chris. Um, our membership is very inexpensive. It costs $65 a year, and that's all to cover your household. That's you and anyone that lives within your house. Uh, they can be related or not related. $65 a year covers you and anyone that lives within your home. Um, that is a fantastic opportunity to take advantage of to protect yourself from something that could be potentially very expensive in the event that someone's flown. Okay, let me ask this question. Is there like a long-term contract or can someone counsel at any time if they choose to do so? Yes, they can. Not, not that we want anyone to counsel because sure. it's a great opportunity, but um, is that option available? It is available, it is. Okay, sounds good. Well, uh, you all have provided a wealth of information today and we'd like to thank uh, both of you all for coming out and sharing the information to our viewing audience. Uh, about the Air Evac Life Team and the uh, membership program that our community can be a part of. Um, so excited to, to see Penny because, like I said, you know, we spent a lot of time together when she was with the uh, Grange Police Department. And we're looking forward to seeing uh, both of you possibly in the future um, here on LGTV. So uh, thank, thank you, you once us. again for being that, here. That'd be great. Um, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we'll have more here on Smoke Signals. Welcome back. Today, my next guest that's on the show is from the Columbus Regional Hospital, Ms. Kelly Brennan. Ms. Kelly, how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you? I'm doing great. Welcome to the show. Thank you. And uh, we're definitely grateful that you were able to come out of your busy schedule to come and be with us today to talk about a very important topic, and we'll get into that here shortly. But uh, if you could, just tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what your roles are at sure. the Columbus Regional and how long you've been there. Okay. Um, so I've been at Columbus Regional now since about 2012. Okay. I'm a registered nurse. I'm also certified in neurosciences. Mm -hmm. um, I've been there running the stroke program um, since 2012, since I've been there. It's okay. kind of my passion. Okay, uh, cool. So I truly enjoy what I do and love the opportunity to get out to the community and share some information. And that is uh, one of the things that we're, we're doing today is um, sharing information to the community that may or may not be aware uh, of our topic and our topic today is concerning strokes and uh, you know some people may have a, a misconception about you know what is a stroke and what's not a stroke so mm -hmm. we have you here today to kind of uh, kind of enlighten us on, uh, on what what to tell the difference in and uh, and talk a little bit about it so what actually is a stroke is kind of just break it down for us so there are two types of strokes um, there's what we call an ischemic stroke, which is caused by a blood clot or a blockage in an artery in the brain. Uh, or there is another kind, less common, but it's called a hemorrhagic stroke, which okay. is caused by bleeding into the brain. Okay. Um, so again, that one's less common. We see probably about 85% of the ischemic type, which is the clogged artery versus the hemorrhagic stroke. Okay. Um, so a good way to think of it is, is like plumbing. So in the brain, you have an artery, Correct. kind of like you have a pipe. Mm -hmm. So the pipe in the brain is like an artery and it gets clogged. And whatever brain tissue that pipe is traveling to, that part of the brain starts to die and go, because it's going without blood or oxygen. Right. So that's when a stroke is happening, when that pipe in the brain is clogged by something. And, and you start having symptoms of a stroke. Okay, which, which is our, our, our next question is, uh, what are some stroke symptoms? So that our viewing audience can understand that, you know, these are what you wanna look for um, when someone may be having a stroke versus something else that they may be having going on. Sure, good question. So there's an acronym called FAST, and it stands for face, arm, speech, and time. Okay. So F meaning in the face, facial droop. So one side of the smile is crooked mm -hmm. 
or speech. Um, they have slurred speech. They can have arm weakness where one arm drifts down or weakness in the leg. Mm. But the easiest way, in my opinion, and this is kind of what I tell my patients, is a stroke happens all of a sudden. So unlike any other illness where you might feel sick over a few days mm -hmm. or it's gradual and onset, a stroke is you're fine one minute, whether you're mowing the lawn, doing laundry, eating, mm -hmm. you're, you're fine, and then boom, all of a sudden, you lose the ability to do something. Okay. So that's number one is key. It happens all of a sudden. Okay. And then the other piece that goes along with it is that one side is different than the other. So it's not like a generalized weakness or um, something that is not one side or the other. So mm -hmm. it's if you have arm weakness, it's one arm. If you mm -hmm. have leg weakness, it's one leg. Mm -hmm. um, if you have numbness or coordination problems, it's mm -hmm. on one side of the body. So mm -hmm. that's why a good test to do is the arms because one side would be different than the other. Okay. If both arms kind of drifted down, then that's probably not a stroke. Okay. I, and you gave some great indications because um, just being able to do a pretest, and, mm -hmm. and we're talking about you know a caller um, it, right. you're noticing that there's something wrong with a family member or, sure. or a friend, and you know just giving a little pretest to you know kind of give 911 a little bit more yes. information uh, as it relates to that. Um, now, uh, and you great you gave some great symptoms to uh, for people to look for. Uh, calling 911, how important is that? Calling 911 is the probably number one thing that the community needs to know. Um, mm -hmm. While the hospital and EMS has all this education and we know what to do, if we never get an initial call or the patient never comes to the hospital right away, mm -hmm. there's nothing that we can do right. um, in terms of acute treatment. So calling 911 at the very first sign of a stroke is so important. Um, the EMS and the fire department and the crews that respond, they're educated and they have some knowledge about is this a stroke or could this be something else. Mm -hmm. um, but letting them come to the scene and helping to make that assessment whether this is something emergent and critical or it's not. Right. Um, so they're there to help the community kind of make that decision. Um, and then if they do think it's a stroke and they need to come to the hospital, the benefit of coming via ambulance versus driving yourself or mm -hmm. having your child or your brother or sister or neighbor drive is the ambulance will be able to actually call the hospital and they let us know that the patient is on the way. Mm -hmm. They'll start IVs for us, they'll get some vital signs, right. they'll give us a chance to prepare because mm -hmm. everything with stroke is so time sensitive. Right, exactly. And uh, being in the field, you know, as it relates to uh, patient care, um, you, there's not a lot of time there. Um, from the time the call is made and then it's being dispatched to fire and EMS and then actually firing EMS, get, fire and EMS getting on the scene, you know, there's a lot of time there. Mm -hmm. And so once they get there and make that assessment of the patient, then we got to get that patient to uh, critical care as soon as possible. Absolutely. And the two things, um, we, we at the hospital, we recognize that on scene time should be as short as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and so we appreciate that. And the two things that we need from the community um, or from the patient or the witness is definitely a good witness phone number, contact information. So mm -hmm. that way when they do come to the hospital, if we have more questions um, or we need to verify any information, we have a witness to call. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the, the time of onset or the time the patient was last normal. Mm -hmm. Because that is another way, um, and it's a very valuable piece of information that we'll use to determine appropriate treatments for mm -hmm. the patient. Right, and with that, um, just to kind of add uh, to calling 911, um, well, by the time first responders arrive on the scene and if the caller was able to use some of those pointers you mentioned earlier mm -hmm. about you know signs and symptoms that just helps us a little bit more in preparing that patient right. getting them to the hospital whether it's by ambulance or by helicopter and yes. in most cases depending on how critical that patient is they're probably going to be flown by helicopter to yes. uh, another hospital correct now uh, let's talk about treatments what are some treatments and services available at Columbus Regional um, great question. So for treatment for uh, the ischemic stroke, so again, that's the most common stroke and that's mm -hmm. the one that's caused by a blockage in an artery. Mm -hmm. So going back to my example of, of like a pipe or plumbing, mm -hmm. 
The first treatment that we use is an IV medication, and it's basically a blood clot busting mm -hmm. medicine. Okay. Um, so, like your Drano, for example, mm -hmm. that's the number one. The, the first thing that we'll use, it goes in through an IV, and then it travels to the brain and hopefully tries to dissolve that clot and break it up. Mm -hmm. So that's um, standard of care. That's first line treatment for ischemic strokes. We do have to do some um, lab work and do a CAT scan to make sure it's not a, a bleeding stroke because we obviously would not want to give that IV medication to someone that has a bleed in their brain. Right. So that's first is that IV medication. It's called IV TPA. It's been around for um, many years now and that's the standard of care. Mm -hmm. The thing with that drug is it's time sensitive so we only have three to maybe in some cases four and a half hours mm -hmm. to administer it to a patient. Right. So again, um, getting there right away you know, is key. Mm -hmm. The second treatment that uh, we at Columbus Regional at Midtown Medical Center have, um, and this is kind of a new and emerging treatment, it's been around for a couple of years, mm -hmm. um, it's called, uh, basically it's clot retrieval. So mm -hmm. again, we go in with the Drano first. If the Drano doesn't clear the clog, mm -hmm. uh, then we want to go in and kind of use the snake, if you will, to remove it. Okay. So this is a procedure that we do in our interventional radiology department. Um, we uh, do a little incision through the groin and thread a catheter up to the brain and kind of grab the clot and pull it out of the body. Mm, and okay. that's kind of how we deal with the larger strokes, the more um, devastating type mm. strokes that we see. Um, so it's important, again, uh, to get the patients there quickly. That procedure, we do have a, a little bit more time. We have about six hours to treat patients. Mm. But again, the sooner with either treatment, uh, the better the outcome. Oh, sounds great. Yeah, definitely uh, getting that treatment is definitely something that will uh, make things better for the patient mm -hmm. and, uh, and improve their quality of life as well. Uh, now, education, because uh, I know you've gone around and you've done several presentations. Of mm -hmm. course, you've been instrumental in, in coming to the LaGrange Fire Department and providing us with this information, which was uh, some great information and uh, and we appreciate you doing it. Do you actually have to go around to any other agencies and provide this information? I do. Um, I, I go everywhere. So whether it's uh, communities or health fairs or private talks uh, at different clubs or groups. Mm -hmm. We do some school education, fire department, we do law enforcement, mm -hmm. and we just want to spread the word. Um, only last year, if I looked at my numbers from uh, Midtown Medical Center, only about a third of patients arrived to the hospital in time to be considered for treatment. Mm -hmm. And so it's really sad when patients come in and the symptoms started the night before, mm -hmm. you know, and now they're paralyzed on one side and they show up the next morning and we have to kind of tell them there's nothing acute treatment that we can do. Um, now the name of the game is physical right. therapy and rehab and it's a pretty long road to recovery. So again, my mission is basically to get the information out to the community because if they're not informed and they don't ever make the call to call 911, we won't be able to make a big difference and you know reduce the disability of stroke. All right. Well. We definitely appreciate um, all that you do. I'm quite sure it, it's never a dull moment because you're <laughs> always on the go. And um, so, uh, but uh, I'm quite sure that Columbus Regional appreciates, you know, all the hard work that you put in and getting this information out into the community. And, uh, and we definitely thank you for coming uh, here to be on the yeah, show absolutely. and to share that information here in our community as well. Um, because there may be someone who's, you know, viewing today, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they may not have a family member, you know, here locally. Mm -hmm that you know has a history of strokes or 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 not only just a history but uh, there may be someone that may have some other health problems and mm -hmm. they, may, they might be able to use this information and share it Absolutely. with some other people that they come in contact with. And that brings up another point, um, talking about who's at risk for a stroke. Um, mm -hmm. We do, uh, this part of the country, we're in the stroke belt, so our incident of stroke is very high compared to the other parts of the country. Mm -hmm. And there's a misconception that stroke is a disease of the elderly, uh, but I'll tell you it's not. The mm -hmm. average age of a stroke patient is about 64 years old mm -hmm. in our community, and that's mm -hmm. kind of different compared to the rest of the nation. Mm -hmm. And so when you look at risk factors, um, hypertension or high blood pressure is mm -hmm. the number one cause. Um, we see that in probably about 80% of all strokes, whether it's caused by a blood clot or it's a bleeding stroke. Mm -hmm. um, that's the number one cause. And uh, smoking, cigarette smoking is another big one. So 
Anybody that has these kind of comorbidities, diabetes, high cholesterol, those are all people that are potentially at risk for having a stroke. Okay. All right. Well, Kelly, we appreciate it again for you being Thank on the you. show. Absolutely. And, uh, uh, we look forward to seeing you on the show and probably some of your staff in the future. Sure, great. All right. great. Well, we're going to take a quick break and when we come back, we'll have more on Smoke Signals. Welcome back. We'd like to thank our special guests for being on the show today and we hope that you received a wealth of information from the Air Evac Life Team, also the Columbus Regional Hospital. So. We'd like to thank you, our viewing audience, for watching another segment of Smoke Signals. So until next time, take care.